Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. So is it all about the money right now? Well, it's certainly closely watched corporate earnings season for sure. The financial markets are getting a lot of attention and there is much discussion about a possible looming slowdown. And oh yeah, how do the din of presidential politics bend the gravity of how we look at this economy too? Welcome again to the most widely watched source of Carolina business and public policy. Thank you for supporting this program for the last 25 years. The advance of this economic cycle is one of the longest in the past 100 years, but does it have us looking over our shoulder at what's next? And what are the implications for business and politics and society in the Carolinas? Well, two economists will help us discern the signs. And later on, the recently resigned budget director of North Carolina joins us, Lee Roberts. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Doug Woodward, Professor of Economics, University of South Carolina. Dr. Jay Bryson, Managing Director and Global Economist, Wells Fargo. And special guest, Lee Roberts, former North Carolina State Budget Director and Managing Director of Sharpview Capital. Here's Chris Williams. Hello, welcome again to our program. Uh, guys, I know this is not a very scientific or, or very, very clinical question, but geez, panther fever has just run rampant, certainly certainly in Charlotte and the Piedmont and, and parts of North Carolina, but I, you can make the argument that across, across both states, uh, people are talking about not just Cam Newton, but the Panthers. Jay, what's, what's the impact of what the Panthers have done this season? Well, I think if you look at Charlotte itself, it certainly has been beneficial. I mean, particularly if you have a lot of out-of-town out of, uh, people coming here, spending their money here. I mean, the, the stadium's been packed every weekend. They're buying a lot more um, merchandise and things of that nature. You know, the hotels and the restaurants have been filled every weekend. So certainly to the local economy here, it's had a beneficial, if, if not temporary, you know, sort of impact. Has, yeah. has the Palmetto State gotten behind the Panthers? Well, we are now. <laughs> we love winners. But I'll be honest with you. I'm surprised uh, before the Panthers did so well how little loyalty there was. I mean, it was magnanimous of Richardson to call, you know, they call this the Carolina Panthers, and it should spread a halo effect across the whole state. But until this year, you really didn't see. You look at the bumper stickers. You know, it's mostly college football. We're a college yeah. football state. We don't have any professional sports, but people's loyalties tend to be around Clemson and Carolina. So the big story last year is really we had Clemson. They're the ones that are benefiting the most right now from uh, mm -hmm. their success uh, on the football field. Yeah, let's move on to the price of oil and what oil has done over the last 12 to 18 months. Jay, are you, um, are you surprised by the visceral reaction broadly across financial markets globally and global financial markets uh, around the cost of oil? Well, you know, initially I was, because you would think in the United States it should be a positive for us, at least a, a net positive for us. And so initially I was kind of surprised that I was trying to get my head around. And I think what's going on with oil, I, when oil goes down, stocks sell off. I think what it is is in real time, it's difficult for investors and financial markets to figure out is the price of oil going down because demand is slowing around the world or is it because of supply? And so, you know, mm -hmm. continuing to increase. And so when you see the oil price collapsing as it did earlier, earlier this month, investors just automatically assume, okay, it's a demand sort of thing that's being caused by slower global growth, and slower global growth would not be good for the stock market. So I think that's kind of why they're trading essentially tick by tick 
right now. Sooner or later, that will decouple, but that's, I think, what's going on right now. You know, and, and Doug, I weighed in on it from the point yeah. of view that, that South Carolina has done, you know, a, 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 a yeoman's job in developing uh, big manufacturing, aerospace, mm -hmm. automotive. Yeah. In reflection of that industry sector, it does does it surprise you that the cost of oil and the you know the cheapening effect of a raw material like oil yeah. has had a negative effect on financial markets and people's yeah. psyche? In fact, I, I absolutely am surprised because I think it's it's a positive for our region uh, when we look at oil. I know the stock market is is tracking oil prices because of the uncertainty it creates, a volatility that was unpredictable. But from an economic point of view, and especially from a regional economic point of view, lower uh, Oil prices, gas prices, um, you know, um, utility costs, uh, everything uh, mm -hmm. that, that it affects is positive for us. Ten billion dollars a month are pumped back into the economy. This was money we were spend. We're still a net importer of oil. We were spending this money and it was going out of the country. It's now coming back in. It's stimulating our economy, up to 120 billion dollars this year. I think uh, that's good for our state. It's good for our business. Do you see more interest by countries like China and India in? patriating some of their industry into the Carolinas, not just because of raw material costs, yep. but f for other factors? Can I say that? Yes, yes. absolutely we do. Uh, uh, I don't think a lot of people know this. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in Chinese investment uh, coming into uh, South Carolina, probably North Carolina as well. Giving an example of that, higher the big um, uh, mm -hmm. white goods company, uh, appliance maker in China, not a brand name in the United States, but huge in Asia, uh, based in China, uh, you know, is buying GE uh, appliance division, or if that gets approved. Mm -hmm. uh, they're based in Louisville right now, but we have a higher plant. And we're going to see more investment come this way. We're also seeing it in real estate, the Chinese investment. Uh, they've really discovered the Carolinas. Because of the exchange rate? Well, uh, no, I, I think because of the long-term stability of the U.S. market, and uh, they've been pushed to be more outward investors right now, and they see the U.S. and the southeastern part of the U.S. is really attractive. You know, Jay, as international economist for a fairly large bank, you spend a lot of time in the Pacific Rim. Mm -hmm. How do you, what, what's your take on that same issue? Um, I, I certainly agree with Doug there. I mean, when I go over there, I talk to investors over there. They're all focused on the on the U.S. You know, the U.S. is the biggest market in the world. I mean, obviously there's Europe, but it's still different sort of markets over there. And you know, the U.S. is one of the, more, the strongest economies in the world right now. So I think that investment coming from Asia, whether it's still the foreign direct investment or whether it's portfolio investment, uh, that's going to continue. We are in the middle of corporate earnings season. Some of its for, uh, uh, releases from fourth quarter of 2015. Some of its full year 2015. Jay, do you? Do you see a trend in corporate earnings uh, for both of those different time, time frames? Well, I think in general, you're, you're looking at some slowing in corporate earnings, and we think that's probably going to continue as well. I mean, the economy is continues to grow here, but it's growing at a you know, relatively you know, moderate sort of pace. Mm -hmm. and I think what you're also going to see this year as you go forward, you're going to start to see some more wage pressures. We saw that in the, in the January employment number, that the, uh, the wage pressure is starting to, to come up a little bit. And so that could squeeze some profit margins um, as we go forward. Do we have mm -hmm. a recession looming because of the slowing growth in the economy? Not this year, not from what we see. Yeah. We're, we've, we've got really positive job growth right now, 3% growth uh, year over year. Wage growth, Jay just mentioned that, uh, that I think might put some inflationary pressures on the whole economy, but it's also going to put uh, money in pockets of, of consumers that are going to spend that. Uh, so we see a lot of momentum going through the rest of this year with uh, very little risk unless there's some really unanticipated shock out there. It is a fragile economy, I will admit that. It is fragile? It, well, yes, we're not growing. that that fast and it's 2% GDP. This is not a booming economy. I think it was good that stock market's correcting a little bit. I think things are getting back actually in line for another leg of this expansion. You know, we've had a, a dialogue here about economies and, 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 and all things around that. We're going to bring our guest on in just a second who's got a little bit of an opinion on that, but is also as a, uh, as a recovering politico to some degree. We'll meet Lee Roberts in just a second. Before we do that, next week on this program, David Jones is the chief executive of, of an IT and infrastructure company called Peak 10. David's got some real opinions on not just IT, but this thing that's being more and more referred to as the Internet of Things. We will talk to David Jones next week, and then in two weeks, we're calling it the Spirits of the Carolinas, and it has nothing to do with the Carolina Panthers or Carolina or Clemson or anything around that. 
Uh, this is Palmetto Brewing, Shelton Vineyards, Dark Corner Distillery, and Red Clay Cider Works. <laughs> I guess it's about drinking in the Carolinas, and we'll find out in a couple weeks. It would seem that our guest is someone with a lot of valuable insight around the workings of the Tar Heel State budget, the clinical financial management of it all, and general knowledge of markets and economies up until recently and for 16 months, in fact. He held the post of North Carolina State Budget Director, which interacts intimately with both branches in the North Carolina General Assembly, of course, the governor's office, and critical agencies that make North Carolina work day to day. We welcome the managing director of the private investment firm now, Sharpview Capital, Lee Roberts. Mr. Director, welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, Lee, you're coming off of uh, a very interesting job as budget director uh, for Governor McCrory and for the citizens of North Carolina. As you reflect back on this, Lee, what surprised you most, maybe about the process, maybe about the politics, maybe about the actual numbers in North Carolina's budget? I mean, when you look at this, Lee, what, what, what do you push back and say, you know, I really never expected X? You know, I think most of the surprises were, were positive surprises. I don't think most people realize the caliber of folks that we have working in North Carolina state government, a lot of really committed, hardworking, thoughtful people who care about doing a good job for the taxpayers. And our legislators too, you know, they're sure not in it for the money. I think they make fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars a year. And most of them are not going to run for something else. They're not trying to build a, a political career. They're in it because they they care about what happens in the state. And so I think that's that's gratifying and I wish more people realized that. The other the other positive surprise is just how strong our state is in from a financial position. Mm -hmm. When I first came into the job, I'd run into people and they'd say, Tell me how bad how bad is it? And, and I'd say, look, we're one of only 10 states in the country with a AAA credit rating from all three ratings agencies. Our debt service metrics are better than average for those 10 states, so we're really in the top five states, top 10% in terms of the strength of our balance sheet. And we've got a strong, growing, diversified economy. So not to say that there aren't challenges, but we're in a very good position as a state in North Carolina. Lee, Lee, Lee how, do, how, does, how, do, how does the good news or how do those things you just talked about, how do they get lost in the, you know, I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but sometimes petty political arguments uh, that go on, even with the same Republican Party in charge, how do those things, how do we get past some of the non-communication that has gone on the past few years? Well, I do think it's getting a little bit better at the state <laughs> level. I think uh, you had a, a pretty significant political change in, in 2010 with the Republicans taking control of the General Assembly and then in 2012 with Governor McCrory getting elected. And so that was a pretty big change from the way things had worked in Raleigh for a long time. And, and it would have been surprising if that had all happened without any, without any yeah. friction. Uh, I, I do think as, um, uh, as we move along here, things are working pretty well in Raleigh. The bond issue is a, is a great example that passed with, passed the General Assembly with strong bipartisan majorities in, in both chambers. It's on the ballot in, uh, in March, March 15th. That's a really good chance for voters to go to the polls and do something positive for the mm -hmm. state. Jay. At Lee, you know, obviously some of the, you know, the, the budget surplus um, that's been generated over the last few years is due to some cyclical factors. You know, the state's doing very well, and that helps tax revenues. You know, when the next downturn comes, when, you know, whenever that is, how sensitive is the budget to those cyclical sort of things? I mean, how, how big of a deficit would that would happen, or is it much more, is the structure, the tax structure now not as cyclically sensitive as it once was? It's not as sensitive as it once was. We're still fairly dependent as a state on income tax revenues, personal income tax and corporate income tax, and obviously those have a significant cyclical mm -hmm. factor to them. One of the significant effects of the comprehensive tax reform that was passed in 2013 uh, and, and has been extended in the most recent session was to lessen the state's dependence on, on income taxes, both personal and corporate, cut the levels significantly. So we now have the lowest personal and corporate income taxes in North Carolina that we've had since the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a good thing for economic competitiveness. It's also a good thing in terms of diversifying our, our revenue profile. Are you seeing real direct dollar for dollar stimulation on the lower tax rate, both corporate and, and uh, personal? We've been careful not to draw direct correlations. I, I would say though that when, when I first took, uh, took office, there was a lot of gloom and doom, a lot of predictions about a billion dollar 
budget shortfall, uh, a lot of comparisons to Kansas and other states where uh, there was a perception that, that maybe tax cuts had gone too far. So I do think we can say at a minimum that tax reform has not destroyed the state's revenue profile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could I just follow up on that? Chris asked me before if I thought we'd go into a recession this year. I don't think so, but I've been around long enough to know that there will be a recession <laughs> in the future, and I always wonder if states are prepared or they think about the balancing the budget over the business cycle. Right now, you created a surplus in South, uh, South Carolina too, it's doing great, but what's the state of the rainy day fund? Uh, is that being depleted or is, that being con is there contributions being made so that we don't have you know, you know, this boom bust cycle in the state budget that everybody has faced in the past and we can avoid? It's a crucial point, so in North Carolina, the reserves were pretty well depleted coming out of the last recession. And that's, that's okay, that's what reserves are for, but the important thing is to build them back up right. in, in the good times, and that's been a key focus of the governor and the General Assembly. So coming into, uh, in, into this next biennium, this next two-year period, reserves, the rainy day fund in North Carolina is about $1.1 billion mm -hmm. each of the next two years. That's getting back to the level that we would like to be Personally, I'd like to see that continue to be added to because, as you say, there's, there's, there's a recession coming at some point. That requires everyone being disciplined about spending so that when you, you do have a surplus, you don't fall prey to the temptation to, to spend it all. You put some away for a rainy day, and, and we've done that, and I, I, I think we'll continue to do that. Okay. Yeah, Lee, if you were the, the, the czar and you could wave your magic wand and, and just legislate by yourself, I mean, is there any things in terms of you know, budgetary things that you really think needs to be done at this point, you know, whether either on the spending side or on, on the revenue side? Well, I think we already have one of the most important tools for controlling spending and making sure that we, uh, we focus on, on reserves and, and, and the long term, which is a balanced budget requirement, which most states have. There's, there's a proposal made in the last session that I think we'll talk about again here in the short session, which is some kind of restriction on, on spending. There was talk of a Taxpayer Protection Act. The Senate actually passed one in, in the last session. And that would force the General Assembly to, uh, to restrict spending to a certain ratio. Uh, what's most commonly talked about is population plus inflation. Mm -hmm. So if you do end up with a surplus, no matter who's in charge or what the political pressures are, you can't spend more than the economy is growing. Mm -hmm. And I think that has a lot to, to recommend it because uh, there will always be political pressures to, to spend more. How do you make sure that spending stays disciplined and that we focus on reserves and on the long term? Uh, Affordable Care Act. Uh, so the Republicans have taken, in, in North Carolina, have taken, and in South Carolina, have taken a lot of heat about not taking the Medicaid federal dollars. Um, a couple of uh, points to reflect on, Lee. So uh, third year of signups and enrollment under the Affordable Care Act uh, seems to be higher signups. Uh, premiums in North Carolina have gone up by about 20 percent. Blue Cross Blue Shield is saying that could have a $400 million shortfall over the next couple of years. Our are the states missing an opportunity to take that Medicaid money? Well, I, I, I think right now Medicaid expansion is more or less off the table in, in North Carolina for two reasons. <clears throat> one is what you just said, that the experience under the ACA so far has not been a positive one. The insurance commissioner, mm -hmm. who's directly elected, he's a Democrat's Democrat, just sent a letter this week to the Obama administration saying that the ACA was driving up costs, lowering consumer choice, and was threatening to drive insurers out of North Carolina. So the experience with the ACA so far has, has not been as positive in North Carolina as I think the proponents of the ACA might have hoped. The, the, the second aspect is just the, the hard, cold political one, which is that there is no appetite in the General Assembly whatsoever for Medicaid expansion this session, probably not in the foreseeable future. So whatever people want to say about the pros or cons, the merits of it, I, I don't see it happening anytime soon mm -hmm. in North Carolina. Okay. Yeah, uh, so obviously, long way until November. Um, anything could happen. But, you know, assuming that the governor is reelected and um, has Republicans in, in both houses, what do you see happening in the you know, next year or two legislatively in, in terms of, you know, the economy? Any, any big things out there that the governor really wants to push forward? Well, I do think the governor will, will be reelected, and, and it seems fairly likely that there will continue to be Republican majorities in, in both houses. I, I think in a, um, in a second term, you would start to see the ability to address some of the longer term structural 
issues that need to be addressed. Pension reform is a, is a great example. So we've got a relatively well-funded pension system in North Carolina, state public employee pension system compared to other states. That doesn't mean it's on the absolute best basis that it that needs to be on going forward. And uh, public employees are are the last employees out there with generous defined benefit plans. Those are great for the retirees. They're not so great for current employees and for and for taxpayers. And I think doing what some other states have done and moving to um, more of a defined contribution system only for future employees. Mm -hmm. So we're, we have the luxury in North Carolina of not having to change the system for anybody who's working for the state currently. But I think there's a lot of appeal to setting a date certain in the future, say beginning of 2017, anybody being hired by the state after that point is in a, in a pension plan that looks a little bit more like what everybody else in North Carolina has. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to go back to the bond issue before yeah. the voters. Uh, um, Two billion dollars uh, potentially for uh, uh, universities and colleges in North Carolina. I think the perception is often, and I work in one, that uh, our facilities are, are first class, and, the, and they look at dorms and they think everybody's living in these luxury, uh, you know, five-star resorts. It's really not the case in our public universities. But a lot of this money goes for labs and, and things that really help make the state more competitive. Can you talk a little bit more about what exactly that money is going to be used for and why voters should be convinced to vote yes? Right. So. Most of our bond issue, it's two billion as you said, 1.35 billion of that goes to the UNC system and to community colleges. And it's focused specifically on science, technology, engineering, and math. So you can probably teach political science in the same building that you've taught it in for, for 100 years, but you can't do that with engineering and science and nursing and medicine. And we have facilities around the state, and I've been in them, that are, they're just dilapidated. They're too small, they're outdated, in some cases, they're dangerous. If we want to have the workforce of the future, we need to have the facilities to train that workforce, and that's what the bond is intended to do. I've heard some people ask about affordability, whether it requires a tax increase. You know, I mentioned our, uh, our, our, our debt ratings, which are pristine. We also are paying off our existing debt very rapidly. Mm -hmm. So even with the, with the issuance of this additional $2 billion in debt, we'll have less debt five years from now than we do this year. So that's why we're so confident in saying that these bonds do not require a tax increase, in no way affect our, our debt affordability or our, our debt, debt capacity. And I'm, I, and I'm assuming somebody like you would model, you know, if we get an interest rate increase of 1%, what would that do to our debt rate? Right. Um, no risk there? Well, you don't have to take it from me. Uh, we do model that, but the, 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 the treasurer runs a debt affordability commission and they issue a report once a year Coincidentally, they just put out that report last week, mm -hmm. and, and they were very comfortable using some pretty exceptional debt assumptions. Their convention is modeling debt issuance at 575, whereas I think if we issued this week, we'd be issuing sub three. Yeah. Uh, e even with an issuance at, at 575, our overall debt service doesn't really increase materially at all because we're paying off our existing debt so rapidly. We've got about a minute left and I want to get your thoughts on this. The North Carolina Supreme Court recently um, unanimously decided that the lawsuit that Governors McCrory, Hunt, as well as Governor Martin brought against the General Assembly was in fact valid and did side with the governors on this and it was around the overreaching, according to the, the suit, of the General Assembly on membership on the Coal Ash Commission. What does that say? Well, I think it was the right decision. And I think most commentary from legal scholars that I've seen agreed with the court. It was, as you say, a pretty decisive decision from the court. And, and the, the, the thrust of it is really just defining the, the scope of executive power vis-a-vis -vis the General Assembly. And, and it just reaffirms that it's the executive branch's job to implement the laws, not to make the laws, but to, to be responsible for the implementation. And sometimes those lines get a little bit blurred. Hopefully this decision restores some clarity to, yeah. to where those lines are. I think it's important too for, for everybody to take it in the spirit it was intended, which is to set those lines for the future in, a, um, uh, in an impersonal way. It's not about the governor versus the leadership of the General Assembly. That they all wanna work together. But it's important from time to time to draw those lines. Thanks, Lee. I wish we had more chance to expand on that. Thank you. Please come back. Thank you for having me. Good to see you, Doug. Great Jay, welcome here. back. Thank you. Until next week, I'm Chris William. Good night.
Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.